Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three, four. From what I understand, this program is recording. We're recording this offline at the present moment. My desire is to uh, communicate, to speak. To talk with you to share. As I've said before, I'm working with ideas. One of the individuals that I am referencing is an individual that is named Dr. Boris Watkins, who runs a Black Business School that can be found online that offers courses for individuals to understand how to build wealth, not just simply wealth, but generational wealth, uh, that which you can pass on to your children, to your grandchildren, to your great-grandchildren, to build wealth. And I'm taking courses presently. I had previously bought or purchased a video that was done by uh, Dr. Watkins and his team uh, called Generation One. And of course, I've seen a lot of things that he had done online, um, posts that he had done, commentary that he had done online on Facebook and other things of that nature. And the approach is academic and yet it is relevant to the times and appreciated his particular approach and really the purpose that he is working with um, is just that, building generational wealth, building, lifting, empowering, helping individuals to move beyond a victim state to a process or through a process of empowerment and understanding that a person can control his or her own destiny, not only an individual, but actually a group of individuals, a race of individuals, a people can control their destiny by taking it in hand, by taking responsibility for their destiny. And so I appreciate that approach. I I believe in it. I know that it works. And so I'm currently taking the uh, course. It's a set of courses really called the Black Experts Empire. And I do that because of the fact that there are a number, a number of items that I personally work with and work on that have to do with Uh, Really, this aspect of building not only generational wealth, but also helping people around the world. That's my intent. That's my desire. And I've got a number of businesses that I work with uh, so that I can work with people on a number of angles. And I'm learning how to do that. I say to people, I'm my parents' first child that graduated from high school. I had four older sisters who probably because of the fact that they had to take care of us who were younger than they, uh, they did not graduate from high school. They had their own challenges and were not able to complete high school. Uh, My older sister, uh, oldest sister, uh, Bonnie, was really a very, very intelligent person, still to this day is a very intelligent person, very gifted individual, could play the piano. I remember that when I was young, can still play the piano today. Um, Very intelligent, did well in school, and um, much respect for her and who she is and what she has done, and uh, was not able to graduate from school. Complications uh, in regard to that. Uh, My sister Christine, 
very beautiful, a very lovely individual also. Her and her sister Bonnie, um, like as they say, peas in a pod together. Uh, what happened to one normally happened to the other. Uh, they still talk, from what I understand, uh, every day, uh, one to the other. And so they were still together um, in life um, at a young age and still to this day, um, at an old age. And then my sister had a uh, passed away, and um, it impacted uh, the entire family, especially my sister that's next older than I, um, um, Patricia, and then impacted me as well as the entire family. And so, but I'm the one that was able to graduate from high school. First, not only now, there are others who graduated from high school and from college. Um, so very grateful. But I'm the first that had done that and the first to do a number of things. But now we have younger um, nieces, nephews, uh, grandchildren, all of those uh, children and grandchildren who have gone on and we're still building, we're still gi giving, we're still uh, making changes and growth and we're grateful and thankful for spirit, for God uh, working in our lives, uh, bringing about change and we know that it can be done. We know that it is being done, not just by us, by by others as well and so very grateful in regard to that. And so we're looking at this process of how change is made. How is it made? And as I said, working with those individuals, um, uh, there are two teachers that I work with. Um, one is named uh, Al Duncan, um, has a program called Duncan Donuts. Uh, no, excuse me, Duncan Nuggets, excuse me, Duncan Nuggets. Uh, and then there's um, Dr. Watkins' brother, who has a master's degree, Lawrence Watkins, um, that I really appreciate their group that is called Great Pro-Black Speakers. And I enjoy that particular group, attended more than the others. Um, and so, therefore, I'm learning a great deal about the business of being a speaker. Um, I, I want to practice that more. And that's one of the reasons that I am on this particular uh, platform and speaking, one of the reasons that I'm here. And so when it comes to speaking and um, uh, teaching verbally, I've been a minister for over 40 years, over 40 years. Uh, we had a discussion about when was our first paid uh, speaking engagement. And of course, as a minister, we are paid to speak, really, um, each week or many times in the course of the week. But I thought about another incident when I was uh, speaking. And this incident was very interesting. I was serving as a minister in Petersburg, Virginia, and I was invited by um, someone, don't know, don't remember exactly how it occurred, but I was invited to give a presentation at Virginia State University, invited to give a presentation, and it was an ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, ethics um, presentation. It concerned babies who were born with a part of their brain missing. It was not there. Uh, I believe the word that I used was an onencephalic baby who was born with half of their brain missing. And I, I needed to do the research to study what it was that I was going to talk about in regard to this particular issue, both from an ethical standpoint and also from a theological standpoint. What should be the stance that one would take? Uh, what would we advise parents in regard to this? It was a a very deep issue, and rarely should, in my estimation, an individual make a personal decision for an individual. Rarely should a person like myself, as a minister, make a decision that a person should make for him or herself. And so I needed to study in order to make that presentation. But I agreed to do that presentation. For the, um, for the president of the 
of the school at the time. I, I believe I had been invited by the coordinator of religious affairs. Did not understand the uh, politics of the environment that I was stepping into, but I wanted to do my very best. Um, yeah, I wanted to represent spirit, wanted to represent God, wanted to represent Jesus Christ. Um, I wanted to represent the education that I had at the time, the fact that I was a minister in the city. Uh, I, I wanted to represent myself. Um, and so I did my research and I went to the school and uh, made my presentation, went to the school, made my presentation and it went well. It went extremely well, so well that they invited me back to do a second presentation on that same topic. And then not only did they invite me back, the president of the university, who at the time was an individual named Doug McClure, President Doug McClure, if I'm saying that correctly, invited me to uh, do a prayer at the uh, celebration, I believe it was, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, celebration that year at Virginia State University. And that was the instance in which Dr. McClure, that day when I did that prayer at that event, Dr. McClure gave me the job of being the religion coordinator of Virginia State University, right there on the spot. As a result of those presentations that I did, gave me the job. He looked me in my eyes and he gave me the job. And I served in that position for that year. It was the last year that he was the president of Virginia State University. But that year, he gave me the job right there on the spot. I did not know what to do other than say yes I will serve you to the very best of my ability. It was an amazing moment. But there have been other moments that I have had in my life that were very much like the same thing, very much like the same thing. When I had served in Oakwood College, which is where I went to undergraduate, I served as an individual that was in what was called the Religion and Theology Forum at that time. Religion and Theology Forum, I think it still exists, and I was serving, and I had been elected to that position by my peers. Um, I had been elected to that position by my peers, and at the Religion and Theology Forum, they had a president, we had a president whose name was Abraham Jules, who is now Pastor Abraham Jules, or Dr. Abraham Jules, from what I understand, haven't spoke with Abraham in years, uh, but um, he was the president. And he wanted to have a grand program. He had a grand idea about who he wanted to bring in, and we needed funds for that. That call for us to raise funds at our Friday meetings, which were held every Friday night on the campus. And we wanted to have a grand program so that people would want to come. And it was geared toward individuals who were ministerial students, and the offering took place. And we had a speaker whose name was an individual great speaker. Uh, his name was Dr. E.E. E. Cleveland, uh, Dr. Earl Cleveland. And Dr. Cleveland came to the meeting. And of course, we did a lot of preliminaries, all of this type of thing. And Dr. Cleveland came and he stood at his time. And I had already taken my offering. And he stood and talked about Preachers who preach everything. We preach, of course, when we pray. We preach when we do greetings. We preach when we do offerings. And since I was taking up the offering, he talked about my taking up the offering and how well I had done in the doing of that. And he actually uh, became an advocate for me as a result of my taking up the offering, so much so that he wrote letters to what are called presidents of the, of the uh, conferences. They are like bishops in other churches, um, or leaders, or regional leaders, if you will, um, to encourage them to give me uh, employment in their particular fields. And it was as a result of his letter 
that was written in my behalf, that I was actually allowed to uh, serve as a minister in uh, what is called a conference. Um, it was because of the intervention of uh, Dr. Earl Cleveland. Um, uh, and when he heard me at a particular um, religion and theology forum uh, that took place. So that's another incident as well. And there was a follow-up to that particular item that took place, a follow-up to that particular item, which was when I came back to my home church, which was in Alexandria, Virginia. I came back after graduating from school, and normally the, the uh, individual who graduated from school as a minister was able to come home to his home church and preach his celebratory sermon um, preach a celebratory sermon since those people who were in that church normally, at least for me, it was normal that many of the people actually had helped the individual to to uh, go to school. They had sent funds down and various other things down, and they had done that for me. They had done that for myself and for my family. Uh, as I said previously, there was a lady that had actually um, uh, sent. Uh, Faithfully, every month, she would send a gift to me, Sister uh, Shirley Sanders, wonderful lady. I think she's uh, passed now. Um, if she hasn't, then um, again, I, I haven't spoken with uh, them in quite a bit. But um, she would send a gift to me. Um, it was uh, uh, just a small gift in a certain kind of way, but a great gift, a meaningful gift. And she would not only send something to me, she would send something to my wife as well and tell her to buy her uh, a set of stockings. And that was meaningful uh, to us. Um, uh, what she sent to me, what she sent to the family, the children, um, it was meaningful. And so at graduation, you would come home and thank the individuals who had helped to make the graduation possible. And Sister Sanders actually came to my graduation from Oakwood College uh, as well. Uh, but I was not able to do that because of the activities that were going on. Uh, we were running what we call a revival or a meeting uh, in which we encouraged people to come accept Christ um, and then to join the church. And that was taking place at that time. And so I joined in with that. And that was taking place. And then thinking that I would get a, a large part in what would take place on the um, night, the out in front of everybody, um, I was given the job, the most important job of my life uh, by an individual who is still alive. His name is uh, Pastor J. Alfred Johnson. Um, J. Alfred Johnson, J. Alfred as we called him. And J. Alfred uh, gave me a job. It was a job of what was then raising and lowering the screen that the pictures would be projected on by the speaker, who was the Honorable William Scales, Jr. And I became very good at raising and lowering that screen. It was a screen uh, that the pictures were projected on. And when I got that job, I made sure that that screen came down on time and when the presentation was finished, it went up on time. I was good at that. I wanted to be good at whatever my responsibilities were because whatever I was doing was honoring God. And I became very good at that. And so after I had raised and lowered the screen faithfully for about two, three weeks or something to that effect, J. Alfred, who was on a committee that determined whether or not ministers were called to that particular field, told me one day, he said, there's going to be a meeting in which your name is going to be discussed. And then he said, said, I tell you what, if I go to the meeting and I come back with a sad face, then you know that your name was not selected as the person that would be given what we call a church or an assignment. And if I come back and I smile, then you know that your name has been accepted. And J. Alfred went to the meeting, and that, that was something because he had to drive um, maybe, let's say, about four hours in order to get to the meeting, and then he had to drive four hours back, um, depending on how fast he was driving, of course. Um, and then he 
came back that afternoon, came back that evening. And when I saw him, he had this look on his face that was just sad. And I was not feeling well when I saw him. And then he walked away and, you know, I was not feeling well as a result of us saw him. And then as he was walking away, he turned around and in his J. Alfred style, I came to know, just grinned from ear to ear. And I knew that I had been, as we say, picked up. And that's how I got my first pastorate. That's because what had taken place is that J. Alfred, when he saw me raising and lowering the screen, gave me my first assignment in front of the people. This is before he had gone down, uh, gone to that meeting. Before he had gone to that meeting. And my first assignment he gave me was to take up the offering in the meeting that was going on with him what we call Elder Scales, William Scales Jr. That was my assignment. I had practiced for a whole year at Religion and Theology Forum for that assignment. And when I did it, Elder Scales put me before the people for the rest of the entire meeting. The rest, because, again, I tried to do that well for him. And so when they speak of, when they were speaking in the Black Experts Empire, when was the first time you actually got paid for speaking before people. Then, of course, I've got these experiences that I've had of speaking before people. This is what I had done for so many years. Then one would ask, why are you in this class? Why are you taking this class? Well, the reason why I was in the class, the reason why I'm in the class is that I always thought of just speaking inside of a church environment about church things. The movement that's different in my life today, the movement that's different even in what I'm doing today, is that the lines that have previously been drawn between what one would call the sacred and the secular or church, and even community. Those lines have almost disappeared. They've, they've almost disappeared. And it wasn't that we did not have things to say about what was going on in our communities. And it wasn't that there were not individuals already saying things about what was going on in the community. There were. It was really that there was some kind of reservation that I had about speaking. You remember, I was already, uh, when I was in Petersburg, which was after I received um, the call to ministry, I was definitely involved in what had taken place at Virginia State University. But that was still a, a variation of being involved in the community. But to actively be conversing about relevant issues in the community, I did not do a great deal of that. I did not speak out a great deal about that. It was, and it is now, because of the movement or the awakening within me that has helped me to understand that I'm a part of the community. What happens in the community um, is, is going on within me, within my family, within, within me. I'm concerned and I'm voicing my concerns about it. I've gone to Africa and seen this uh, so many years ago, nearly 12 years ago really, since the last time I've been to Africa. Uh, but I've got friends that I just saw the other day um, who are impacted by what goes on daily in Africa. And I ask people from Africa, almost on a daily basis as well, 
how are things going in the country and countries that they're from? Who's the president? What's the government like there? How are people doing there? And I know Africa has a story to tell. The people of Africa, in spite of the fact that some have referred to them as countries that are not doing well, I saw an individual who's, I believe the correct pronunciation of the name may be Akron, A-K-O-N, who said that the conditions in Africa are not what we have been told that they were or that they are. That Africa is a thriving, thriving continent that has so many opportunities. And we want to tell our own story. I've dreamed of a Wakanda-like environment for people Black people, but really for all people, who will embrace it, who will live it. I've dreamed of that for years. I've dreamed of that for years and still dream it now. As a matter of fact, one of my clients said to me yesterday, because I'm talking to him, I've coached him, he's passed a significant test, and he's beginning to uh, believe in his own power. His father was a very powerful individual in the field that he's in. And he's beginning to believe and to embrace his own power. And he said to me, I'm going to build a city. And he initially said, don't laugh. And I said, I'm not laughing. I knew that this was going to happen for him. I knew it. It's in his DNA. That's what we do. We coach people to greatness. We coach them to greatness. I've seen this greatness within myself. I am the first of my parents' children to graduate from school because some way, somehow, spirit sparked within me that it was possible for me. It was possible for me in spite of the fact that my other sisters, siblings, had not graduated. They were all intelligent, every one of them, both intuitively, intellectually, educationally. They were all intelligent. And I, it was almost like they had paved the way, as far as intelligence was concerned, they had paved the way for me to embrace that so that I could go on and do other things. And I'm grateful for how spirit made it possible for me to grow. My mother, intelligent. My father, intelligent. And I was able to go forth with that and to graduate from college. And it was the need to believe and to have a community, really, that believed in the possibilities for me. And that's what I want to be to you, to any individual, to every individual, and in spite of the fact that there may be others who are saying to you that you can't do this and you can't do that and are actually trying to pull you down, the naysayers, the haters, whoever they may be, doesn't matter. It could be in your family, biological family, could be in your community, could be sitting next to you, whatever it may be. It doesn't matter who they are. What you need is a beloved community that's around you, that supports you, that knows that greatness is within you. Not because you just said it, but knows that greatness is within you. They see it first within themselves, and then they see it within you, the individual as well. And you become supportive of each other on this journey of life. You become supportive of each other on this journey of life. You become supportive of each other on this journey of life. And so this is what is taking place. This is why I'm involved with the program with Dr. Boris Atkins and Al Duncan and Lawrence Watkins. This, this is what the program for me is all about because I see it in the media. I see individuals who are reaching new levels and we don't just simply want to be a people who are worshiping goddess-like people or god-like people. 
We don't want to do that. We don't want to just simply be individuals who are saying that certain people have special abilities that everyone else does not have. We, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be those who just follow one person and then somebody comes by and destroys, kills even that one person. No. That's not what we want to be. Not today. Not today. Not today. Maybe in the past, that might have been fine. Not today. What we want to be today are a group of individuals who believe in the same set of principles and ideas so that even if one falls for whatever reason, and there could be multitudes of reasons that the others go through the appropriate time of giving honor and reverence to that individual for what they have contributed to the struggle or to the vision or to the battle or whatever. Yes, honor that individual. No question about that. But we just keep it moving. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. I sometimes think about the what is called the Trail of Tears as they talk about the Native Americans who were here before anybody else that we know of got here. Certainly before Columbus got here. And he didn't discover it because they were already here. And the history is being told now that was hidden before. The history is being told. So he was already here. They were already here before he got here. But then through all of the things that we are now, and a few years ago, became aware of, that they were then told to go west and given the blankets and all of this, all of this, and then travel what became known as the Trail of Tears. And along the way, the weak died. The weak died. But the weak were strong enough to tell those who could go on, you must keep it moving. You must be resilient. You must go forward. You must rise up from these tears that you're crying and that we're all crying. And you must keep going. And you can't wait a long time to keep going because the snow is going to fall. And if you stay here too long, you will die with me. We must all do that now. We must all do that. We cannot wait another 50 years for a new leader to come after one falls. We cannot wait another 40 years or another 30 years or another 20 years or another 10 years or another five or two or one. We must keep it moving. Must keep it moving. Whatever you're building, Build with somebody, build at the same time, build together, keep it moving. And whether that dying part is physical, mental, emotional, whatever it may be, because this is real stuff that's going on. It's real stuff, but it's not permanent, it's not enduring. We are divine beings. We are divine beings. We are infinite. God never dies, and we are in God. God is in us. We, we can never be separated from spirit. Spirit, God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we can never be separated. We have nothing to fear about life. We embrace this. I say to people, if David can be certain of God's presence in David's life, he worked that out in the privacy of his relationship with God, then certainly I can be certain of the presence of God in my life. And David was certain. 
He meditated, he prayed, he wrote, he sung, he did whatever he needed to do in order to come to that level of certainty in his life. He wasn't playing church, nor was it play church. He wasn't playing spiritual sinner, nor was it play spiritual sinner. He was having this experience with God that wasn't dependent on where he was. It was real. So he didn't complain about daddy leaving me out on the hills with the sheep. He was out with spirit. He was out with God and having a conversation with God. And he brought his own music. What he didn't have, he created. We must do the same. All of us. I tell people I, I believe in a world where people, through whatever level of intelligence it is, it must be intelligence. It does not necessarily talking about just read the book intelligence, but it must be intelligence, spiritual intelligence, intellectual intelligence, yes, but spiritual intelligence, imaginative intelligence, creative intelligence. All of these levels of intelligence is intuitional intelligence, emotional intelligence. All of these intelligences working together. And if they're not inherently can... Uh, they've not been worked out within you, then surround yourself with those individuals. That's what a community is. Those individuals who have those intelligences. And that's what it means to be a beloved community where all parts are present. All parts are present. And so I'm just one. I want to contribute to the world. I want to contribute to you. I want to contribute to life. That's why I'm doing these programs. That's why I'm doing this, because I want to contribute. I want you to be at your best, to live your authentic life, and to reach the world. Everybody. I dream a world that works for everybody. I believe heaven is going to be on earth. Not because God in the form that we normally think of God as being like some big being out somewhere in some heaven that's distance from this earth. I believe that heaven is what we are creating by our own consciousness, by our own words, our own thoughts, our words, our actions, our emotions, I believe heaven is us here on this earth, evolving to a state of consciousness where we see that all things are good. And that includes us as individuals. All is good. It's what we're creating. We're God expressing. We're divine beings. The Bible says we're children of God. It says now we're children of God, not tomorrow, not after I stop doing something wrong or thinking the least wrong thought. No, I, I, I don't have children, biological children or even children that I've said are mine. And then it is that now you're a child, now you're not. Now you're a child. You remember that song some people remember, she loves me, she loves me not. He loves me, he loves me. No, we don't play that. Don't play that. Don't play that. God don't, does not play that. That Santa Claus stuff, he knows when you've been good or bad, so be good for goodness sake. No, did you notice your parents or whoever it was that truly loved you? They love you whether you did good, bad, indifferent, or anything in between. I tell people that a mother's body, and you can say a father's mind and heart, stretches to accommodate any child they might have, any child. And that's metaphysical. That's not just physical. That's metaphysical. Metaphysical. It's the truth anyhow. Any way you stretch it. And so, 
I've been blessed. I'm still being blessed. That's one of the reasons that I'm talking with you. We have a class that we do is that the Spirit Victory Praise Transformational Leadership Institute on Teachable is called the Inner Journey of Self-Awareness to Become Your Beautiful, Authentic Self. You can look for the class there. That's the one that we're featuring now. The other classes on visualization. There are classes called the Restore of the Self, Restoration of the Self. There are classes that we do that really have the intent of helping an individual to understand God within. God within. The Bible again says in pretty much every spiritual teaching that there is, says that God is within. And it's a discovery process that one goes through in order to affirm that to be convicted about it so that you don't forget it. It's a discovery process, if you're willing, <laughs> if you're willing. And I laugh because I'm convicted that the, the movies actually teach this. The comic books actually teach it. The writings of the poets and the authors is, is there right before our eyes, if we will see it. And I teach it out of the writings. I teach it out of the writings. Because one day I saw it. And I have not been the same since. So I invite you to to come travel. It's a beautiful journey. (laughs) It's a wonderful journey. There's nothing to be afraid of whatsoever. The class, the inner journey of self-awareness to become your beautiful or your handsome, authentic self, beautiful class. It's it's, it's just wonderful. You can get the first uh, three lessons for that class absolutely free, no cost to you, none whatsoever. Uh, You can get it absolutely free, see how it is. Um, um, Just just really, uh, you can get get it for free. Uh, we've got something here on YouTube, and uh, we're telling you about it via the uh, different uh, channels, media channels that we are working with. You will enjoy life itself more when you have these awarenesses, this this enlightened understanding of how life works, of who you really are. You will enjoy life more. And so... Again, I want to show up so that we can all enjoy life more. And so for now, I want to encourage you to just participate at a very high level. Be resilient in life. Know that there is something inside of you that's indomitable. It cannot, cannot be defeated by anything that you will ever encounter. You have something inside of you that you should never be afraid of any boogeyman, as we call them. Never. Because that the text says, greater is he that is in you than anything that you might encounter in the world. Greater is he that is in you. You are the greatest of all time. You're the greatest you of all time. Claim that. Know that. Affirm that over and over and over again until you believe it in the deepest recesses of your own heart. God bless you.